feel amazing. Are people nicer to you? More respectful? Yes, my dad especially is very nice to me right now. I'm like, Dad, thank you. <laughs> This is the best of BYU Sports Nation. Interview and insight from this week in Cougar Sports. Every Saturday, only on BYU Radio. To lead off, here's the double coverage interview of the week. We are live in Studio B with your day-to-day -day BYU Sports play-by-play. -play. He's Dave McCann. My name is Jason Shepard, and we are so happy to be joined by Tori McElhaney. Tori covers the Atlanta Falcons for AtlantaFalcons.com. She joins us now on BYU Sports Nation. Tori, thanks for joining us today. How are you? I'm good. How are y'all? We are doing great, and uh, I love the y'all. Uh, I am a sucker for a southern <laughs> accent. I could listen to it all day, so I appreciate you bringing it right out of the gate. Oh, you know, y'all is just in my everyday vernacular. It just is. Very, look, there's nothing, there is nothing it just wrong. just rolls off the tongue. It certainly does. It certainly does. <laughs> so, so obviously, we want to talk a lot about Tyler Algier. And, and I guess uh, you, you, you did a piece on him, which we'll certainly get into more as the interview goes along. But I'm curious, just your overall impressions of Tyler after talking to him and being around him for a little while. Yeah, he is a very um, humble guy for him to be such like a – a tough runner. I, I think it was one of my colleagues called him a, a bowling ball with spikes and for him to be a bowling ball with spikes, like out on the football field, to, but just, just be like a good guy, humble guy off the field. He even paid a compliment to you guys yesterday and said that y'all would take good care of me coming on here. So I, honestly, it's, it's been very, very interesting to get to know him. And I know all, the BYU nation is, is very proud of, of Tyler Ad Algier. Well, BYU fans uh, love Algier, uh, and they, they kind of grew the relationship because he was a linebacker and special teams and then mm -hmm. came into uh, the running back spot due to some injuries, and then he just, he just never left. But uh, his toughness and uh, his um, – and, and, and you've pointed it out too in, in your work his, – his ability to get stronger as the game goes on and to wear mm -hmm. teams down to where in the second half no one really wants to tackle him. That was something that came up when I was talking to scouts and when I was talking to the position coaches, um, it, it, just talking about, I, I think the direct quote was from Michael Petrie, who is the Falcons running backs coach. And he said, he was like, they really have to make a business decision. You talk about defenders tackling Tyler Algier. They have to make a business decision in the second half to be like, you know what, do I conserve energy or do I really go after these guys? Uh, and that's something that came up a couple of times in every interview that I did. In your piece, and I thought uh, it, was, it was very well done, there's a line in there that stood out to me when you wrote, he's a bowling ball that knows exactly where the pins are. Now that's written mm -hmm. by someone who's been in the bowling lanes before and knows exactly uh, what, how that all works. But explain the, the metaphor back to Algier and his skill set from what you've observed. Yes, yeah, so it, it, it all goes back, honestly, to his football IQ in that year of playing linebacker. That was something that the Falcons were very interested in. They very much value versatility in every aspect of the game. And so having a running back who has a year's worth of experience playing linebacker at this level was very – it was something that was very intriguing for the Falcons because they did feel like you saw how Tyler Algier took – that year of playing linebacker and transformed it into the way that he attacks the run game and, and how he knows and understands fits and fronts and where blitz attacks are coming from and where to pick up guys. It was very, very interesting when you're talking to the Falcons and that they saw the value of that in, in his overall football IQ. You know, Tori, and it, this is not just an NFL thing. This is any sport. When you get to a situation where you're talking about guys getting drafted or bringing players into a situation, it's as much about how good they are. I mean, that's certainly, you know, everybody's going to take a look at that. But it's as much about fit and opportunity as it is about what they actually bring to the field or the court. In terms of Tyler Algier, when he got drafted by the Falcons, I thought, man, this is a really, really good opportunity for him. What type of opportunity do you feel he has in Atlanta? 
Yeah, I actually think he has a pretty good opportunity, especially when you're looking at that he's kind of getting in on the ground floor of this overall transition that's happening in Atlanta with Arthur Smith taking over play calling. And I, I do think that it's going to be really interesting to see because I think right now when you look at the Atlanta Falcons backfield, it does look a little crowded. And, and I think you you look at Cordero Patterson as the guy who's going to be taking the brunt of the load. But when you look at someone like Cordell Patterson, he's not your traditional running back. Tyler Algier kind of is. And so you want to be able to use Cordell Patterson in a number of ways. And I think because of that, it opens the door for someone like Tyler to kind of get some good live reps in his very first year. Visiting with Tori McElhaney, AtlantaFalcons.com. Now, uh, BYU fans aren't gamblers for the most part, but we do play fantasy football. So where should Algier be in our fantasy football drafts after what you've seen and what you just said? I think it'll be – I feel like I'll be able to give you guys a better answer <laughs> of that when we get to training camp. Right now in mini camp, it's really hard to see kind of what that rotation is really going to look like, especially with Cordero Patterson not being out on the field. So – and they're not necessarily going – 100% at all. So have me back on in August, and I think I'll be able to give you a better answer then. All right, we're booking that. Well, right? I, I may follow up an unanswerable <laughs> question with another unanswerable question for a lot of the reasons that you just mentioned, but can you see a scenario that at some point this year, Tyler Algier could be a starting running back for the Falcons? Is that too far-fetched to even think about? Hey, now, before you answer, Tori, <laughs> Steve Young told us that he believes by week three – Okay. Okay. I honestly, I don't think that's too far fetched to, to think that he couldn't go out and carry the brunt of the load. Uh, I think when it comes to Arthur Smith's overall scheme, uh, it, it's, I sometimes put less weight on who's the starting offense because he does have so many packages that he uses personnel packages and all of that kind of stuff. It wouldn't surprise me if, you know, they run Tyler Algier out there on the very first play in week four, but he's not necessarily your quote unquote starter, if that makes sense. You know, I, I think when it comes to how op Arthur Smith operates in this offense, that's it, it wouldn't surprise me how how Tyler Algier's overall scope of where he's going and what he's doing in year one changes from week to week. We got two big stories out of BYU at the NFL. Zach Wilson going to the lowly Jets and Algier going to the lowly Falcons. We'll leave the Jets for Zach, and we'll talk to him about that. But what about the Falcons and this, this program that Algier is now a part of? Uh, what trajectory are they on, and can they get good? Yeah, it's, it, that's a great question, and it's one a lot of Falcons fans ask on the daily. Uh, it's, we really are in the very, very early stages of a transition for the Falcons. There, when Terry Fonda and Arthur Smith first got in here last year, they were kind of looking at a very uphill battle in terms of getting right by the salary cap. You're slowly starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel, and they will be able to have the opportunity in 2023 to really build kind of what they want to. They'll actually have the money to do that. So you are seeing the Falcons on a – it's not a super, super exciting trajectory in 2022, but I keep telling people, like, look at the bigger picture, how much money they're going to have towards the cap, how they're going to be able to utilize their first two draft classes, which does include Tyler, and how they develop these two classes into a, a team in 2024, 2025. So it, it's a long process. I think AJ Terrell said it best. He was like, I consider this a marathon, not a sprint for the organization. And I do think that's how I view it as well. Look, every team's going to want to have a balance of run and pass, but with Matt Ryan no longer in Atlanta, now with the Colts, do you feel like there will be more reliance on the running game or are, are, the, are the offensive coaches in Atlanta, are they confident enough, whether it's Mariota, whether it's the, the, the rookie Ritter, that, that they can continue the passing attack that they've had to where you don't necessarily feel you need to rely on the running game more? Does that make sense? Yes, no, that makes total sense. I, I do think that the goal is all the time to be balanced offensively, and I think it goes to show how much weight they're still putting 
on the pass game, whether it is Mariota or whether it is Ritter, by going out and getting Drake London with the number eight overall pick. And they got Kyle Pitts with the number four overall pick last year. The pass game is still very, very important to them in their entire operation. I just think now having a very mobile quarterback in a way that you didn't have that with Matt Ryan before with Marcus Mariota – potentially, I think that is where you add another layer. You have a quarterback that can (laughs) take it out of the pocket, to be completely honest, and and kind of pick up four yards if he needs to. So I I do nothing against Matt Ryan, who we we like to call Matty Wills. But I I will say I do think Marcus Mariota is probably a little bit faster and a little bit more athletic in in terms of that, in that terms. Um, So overall, I think when you look at the balance of the offense, that's always what they're going to try and get. Hey, Tori, speaking of fast athletic quarterbacks, and the last question for you, how happy are the Falcons to see Taysom Hill moving from quarterback to tight end for the Saints? I'm sure they're over the moon. It's funny (laughs) because uh, they are – he's been so interesting for the Falcon against the Falcons over the last couple of years because they've seen him in so many different roles and it's almost like you never exactly know what he's going to provide the the Falcons um, in a game but it's funny too because uh, I, I saw something the other day the Falcons have Felipe Franks uh, essentially converting to tight end right now and someone said Taysom Hill walked so that Felipe Franks could fly, and I thought that was the funniest tweet of this offseason so far. <laughs> that is that is awesome. Great answer. Thank you. Tori, great stuff. The piece was phenomenal. For those that haven't uh, checked it out, go to atlantafalcons.com, and you can read Tori's piece on Tyler Algier. We appreciate you taking a few minutes today. Thank you for joining us. We will certainly have you on again. Yeah, in August, right? <laughs> Yes, in August. I'll, I'll be able to talk all about that chart then. <laughs> Very nice. Thank you, Tori. We appreciate it. Have a great day. That was one of our favorite interviews this week. You're listening to the best of BYU Sports Nation. This is the best of BYU Sports Nation on BYU Radio. All rise and shout. It's time for What's Trending. You're talking about it, and so are we. It's what's trending on BYU Sports Nation. Individual dominating performances. As Dave just mentioned, the 2021-2022 athletic calendar year at Brigham Young University will go down as one of the greatest in BYU athletics history. Topped off this past weekend with not one, but two individual national championships. In the steeplechase by Courtney Wayman, she broke an NCAA record in doing so, and Ashton Reiner's individual national championship throwing the javelin okay so dave uh we just talked about it long list of incredible athletes got us thinking what were the greatest and most memorable individual performances of the past year by a byu athlete uh there are many ways you can take this conversation as we found out this morning where are you starting and it's interesting that um that we've compiled this list and it's been that kind of a year when the basketball team wasn't great, didn't make the NCAA tournament for the men, and uh, the football team lost in the Independence Bowl. So those are the marquee that we usually go, was it a good year? How'd those teams do? We're talking about everybody else yeah. that carried the load this year. And, uh, and, and Wayman, since she's coming on the show, I, I, let's, she's right there at the top of the list. National championship in the steeplechase, fastest American in the world this year, and fifth fastest all time running the steeplechase. It's incredible. Nine minutes and 16 seconds. What's going to be better than that? Like, can we just go ahead and dub that? Like, that's the most impressive individual performance to win a national championship, break a record, and then for the reasons you just pointed out, like, fastest in the in the world thus far this year? Think about it. She should get a deal with Domino's Pizza because she can get a pizza to your house in nine minutes and 16 <laughs> seconds. That beats a half hour or a free pizza uh, no matter what. Uh, congratulations to her. I'm excited to talk to her here coming up this morning. What a, what a story she is. Okay. Uh, Ashton Reiner is a unique case as yep. well because BYU had not won a field national championship, at least in the field events, in three decades. you got to go all the way back to 1992, the last time a woman won a national championship in a field event. BYU had never won the javelin. Ashton Reiner changed all of that. So, again, her natty is very unique. Courtney and Ashton, in a lot of ways, really 
kind of setting new marks in the record books at BYU in their, in their own unique ways. Well, and then you got to go Connor Mance, another national champion. Oh, ho hum, back that's, to back. That's what he does. Back to back. A sec, you know what they say? It's harder to, it's, it's the hardest thing to do is to defend a national championship. And he did that in the men's cross country final. Yeah. And, and, and he's a, he's another tremendous story uh, with a bright future head running. Um, and, and so he and Whitney Orton, another national champion. So we're talking about the, this is the Mount Rushmore of the list, the top four, so yeah. to speak. Is BYU Our a running school all champions. of a sudden? Is BYU a track and field school? Uh, the Longhorns would say we've always been a running school uh, if Taysom's a quarterback. But <laughs> it seems like, uh, yeah, they have carried the, the, they've carried the flag on flag day as we talk. They have carried the flag this year for BYU for national titles. And now as we, as we move further down the list, it's just one hit after the other. Yes. Um, we start with the national champions, but I mean, yeah. I watched firsthand on several occasions this year BYU's best all around gymnast, Sadie Minor Van Tassel, uh, set her new career marks. She had a career best in the all around 39.525 mm. against Arizona in her final home meet. She led the charge for one of Guard Young's really, really talented teams. This is a program that's been consistently on the rise. They finish ranked in the top 20 again, and Sadie Minor Van Tassel's career best, career high 39.525, was an unforgettable performance. And you've tossed around the idea that uh, gymnastics might win the first Big 12 championship. Listen, BYU. Oklahoma has dominated that conference. I mean, just absolutely dominated that conference. When they leave for the SEC, then it's kind of open game. It's Denver and uh, Iowa State's okay, West Virginia's okay, but it's going to be probably between Denver and... And BYU, Denver is in the Big 12 Gymnastics Conference. So, yeah, BYU is going to have an immediate chance to win that title. Tyler Algier. Oh, man. We were over there at uh, Lavelle Edwards Stadium. That game went like six hours. Uh, <laughs> it was crazy. The Cavaliers scored 35 points in the second quarter. <laughs> we made some adjustments. They only scored seven in the second half. Tyler Algier scored the whole game long. He ran for 266 yards. He scored five touchdowns, tying the school record for most touchdowns in a game. With Jamal Williams. He ran through uh, the Cavalier defense. Now, Virginia came in in second place in their division in the ACC. They had big plans. They win this game, and they're going home thinking they're going to contend for the division title and go play for the right to go to a, a mega bowl game. But BYU just took them out, and this guy did it almost by himself. How about, I think the most impressive thing for me, other than the five touchdowns, which absolutely just jumps off the page, is the average per carry. Every time he touched the ball, 9.2 yards per rush. So, hey, Tyler, uh, I'm going to give you the ball, and we're going to be guaranteed at least 9.2 yards. Right and he here. did it against a Bronco Mendenhall defense. I mean, he's the head coach. The, the Bronco stopped the run when he was at BYU. That's what he did. Mm. Those guys were diving at ankles, and Algier just ran over him like a truck. Yeah, incredible It was fun to watch. How about some BYU softball? Violet Zavodnik against Iowa State. Now, this was probably the best series that BYU women's softball played all year, taking down uh, the future Big 12 opponent, Cyclones. Zavodnik, in that Saturday third game, two home runs, three for four, five runs driven in, and this was really the uh, capped the sweet performance by BYU softball. The little gritty over the home plate, which became her signature celebration. She gets the home run chain. Zavodnik was the best player in the West Coast Conference. It's an absolute travesty, a travesty mockery, if you will, Dave. Yeah, it's both those that words. she did not get West Coast Conference Player of the Year. But hey, she had her day in the sun, quite literally, against Iowa. And State. she's one of my favorites. How how good is she going to be next season? Yeah, she, she just gets by better the way, yeah, she was a and sophomore. better. It's just a sophomore. She was a sophomore. Might be the greatest ever that comes through. She was the West Coast Conference Player of the Year and Freshman of the Year in the same season. Yeah. Yeah. She should have been the four-year sweep Correct. as Player of the Year. Correct. Her, her senior year will be in the Big 12. So that'll be cool. Yeah, how about that? Yeah. All right, let's continue on along the list. Michaela uh, Coulihan, hat trick against Alabama. It's just nothing. You know, it's what she does. That was in the NCAA in the tournament. NCAA tournament. That was in the NCAA tournament. It's one thing to have a hat trick in soccer. Like, whoa, that's an incredible performance. But to do it in the tournament, to advance in a single elimination bracket like that, in just dominant performance. I mean, Michaela Coulihan, there's a reason that she's one of the best to ever play at BYU. And Think about this run of players with you. Ashley Hatch, you got Coulihan. Yeah. Um, and the list goes on and on of these these great players. I mean, yeah, BYU women's soccer, soccer is in a really great place. Okay, they got three players in the National Women's Soccer League, led by Ashley Hatch, 
and then Michaela Coulihan and Cameron Character. Tucker. Okay. How about Alex Barcelo against Pepperdine, Dave? 33 points, made nine of 10 threes. <laughs> that was one of those nights where you're like, hey, and on the road, by the way, this wasn't in the confines of the Marriott. No, no this is at the Firestone Fieldhouse where BYU has struggled traditionally. Yeah. And it's, this is the game where you're like, get it to Alex, let him shoot every single time. And they weren't all just wide open shots either. He had to move and juke a little bit. But, man, he was on fire. Mm. That was a great performance by Barcelo, one of the best of the year. 33, as you mentioned, 9 of 10 shooting the three. I think it was after this. Didn't Billis come on after this and say yes. he's the best shooter in yes. America? Yes. Yeah, it's not surprising that Jay Billis was like, yeah, Alex Barcelo is the best shooter in and, and that's why he's at all these NBA camps, including the Hawks today. When you can shoot at that elite of a level, like you're going to get a look. Yeah. And what's, what's the deal here? Yeah, their teams are about to find out. How about another shooter? Uh, yeah, Paisley Harding on the road at Utah. Now, this one gets overlooked because it wasn't on BYU TV and there were still some other sports happening simultaneously. Paisley Harding lifting BYU to a win at Utah, which this really turned out to be BYU's best win of the season, Dave, in an unforgettable season for the Cougars and Jeff Judkins. This road win by the metrics, when all was said and done, was BYU's best win. It took 33 points from Paisley Harding against Utah, but she wasn't done. She did it again on the road against BYU's second toughest opponent, which gave them their second best win. And she got knocked out of that game. At Gonzaga. Got some stitches, came back in. Like a Disney movie, and finished the job. They they went up there, and what a tag team she was with Gonzalez. Maybe that's why Shaylee's looking around for some other options in the portal because so much attention would have to be put on Paisley. That yeah. allowed Gonzalez to get shots, and when Gonzalez was getting double teamed, Paisley and Tegan Graham and the others lit it up. Yeah. But uh, Harding was fantastic. I think she Carson. had 19 points in the second half against Gonzaga with stitches. Yeah, And you have to know she's shooting. Somebody guard her. And that, that was a pretty good NCAA tournament Gonzaga team. Yeah, yeah, you Literally. bet. Carson Lundell winning the regionals, helping BYU get to the nationals. We had him here on the show before the regionals. What a, what a fine young man, a great golfer. Yeah, we mentioned Cam Tucker earlier. We were talking about BYU's great women's soccer players. She had a four spot against St. Mary's. Okay, let's see. Hey, hat <laughs> trick's okay. How about one more? Four goals in the same game against St. Mary's. A 7 nothing dominant performance by Cameron Tucker. If you're Tucker. the goalie uh, and you give up four goals to the same person, <laughs> you know, you got to dig in deep just to come back from that. Aye, aye, aye. That or yell at your defense a little bit more. <laughs> How about a little help? What in the world is going on? The best of BYU Sports Nation will be back after this on BYU Radio. Get caught up in the week in Cougar Sports. This is the best of BYU Sports Nation. We are live in Studio B. It is a national championship show on this Tuesday, June 14th. The second of our national champions is Ashton Reiner, Javelin with uh, the Javelin expertise, I should say. She's the best of the best in the country in the NCAA. Ashton, congratulations and welcome back. Thank you. Yeah, how's it feel? Feels pretty good. Yeah? Feel blessed. Feel amazing. Are people nicer to you? More respectful? Yes, my dad especially is very nice to me right now. I'm like, Dad, thank you. <laughs> you should be. Yes. Should he's be. proud of you. Father's he's... Day coming up. You already gave him the greatest Father's That's Day present you could possibly me. hope for. Just yes. take a picture of it on Sunday. I was like, here you time. go. You can have it. No, I'm just kidding. Don't. You can <laughs> yeah. have it. Well, it's retroactive, too. Like, if you forget something in the years to coming, just be like, hey, remember that one time I won the national championship? We're good. Yes. You know, yes. parents, uh, and, and we got kids. I have some older kids. Spencer's so much younger than I. But we, we agonize with our kids through these events, whether it's T-ball, Little League, soccer, track and field, and, and, and on and on. So for your parents to, to see you do this, through the bumps that you've had along the way where their support's been so huge, what would that mean to you? What does it mean to them? Um... I feel like they're the ones that have seen the most trials in my life. And to them, I, I, I know this is bad to say, but I don't throw javelin for myself. Like, if anything, it is so hard and just, like, mentally hard. But, like, I do it for my parents to show them, like, hey, like, you guys did good. Like, all my siblings are so um, – they're just amazing. And I think, like, for them, I'm like, hey, guys, you guys are good parents. You guys raised – amazing kids and so I think just to show them my appreciation for them I was like this na national championships for them well if you weren't the favorite child you're the favorite child yeah. now oh uh, yeah have you, you shown the, the trophy to your siblings to go yeah this this is what I got <laughs> after Colton probably that's <laughs> yeah. my oldest brother okay let's talk about the performance um you accomplished it on your first throw did you know 
Like when when you hit that first throw, you're like, I'm going to win the national championship. Yes, but I was like, I better win with this throw because I threw two meters behind the line. And yeah. I was like, if I don't win with this, I'm going to be so mad. <laughs> yeah, to, like people were pointing that out like, whoa, and she threw it from, you know, a pretty good distance Why behind did you the do line. That? So I was feeling very fast in my warm-ups. And so my coach was like, hey, just move two feet back. And I was like, yeah, I probably should. Because honestly, I'd rather have two meters behind the line instead of like two feet after the yeah, line. Yeah, fault. Yes. And so I was like, yeah, I'll just move back. And then when I did, I was like, oh, no. <laughs> but I still won with it. So I'm super happy with it. Better than scratching. Okay. Yeah. No No question. Did it feel like, as soon as it left your hand, like home run hitters will say, I knew it was gone as soon as the ball left the bat. Did you Did you feel like, hey, this is going places? Yes, because um, the practice right before, I had all these great feelings. Like my coaches were like, just make sure you get this feeling and it's going gonna, it's gonna to leave your hand perfectly. I had that feeling and I knocked the wind out of myself and that's usually a good sign. Whoa. Yes. Um, everyone's like, did you hurt your arm? Because if you like watch right after that throw, I was like, like, I hurt so bad, and I couldn't speak because I knocked the wind out of myself. So I knew it was good. Okay, so that, that throw sticks, and you, you see that it's incredible. Is that, I mean, just by nature of it being in the national championship, is that the best throw you've ever had, or do you still feel like, uh, I've, I've thrown better before? I've definitely thrown better before. Really? 100%, yes. So timing was a little off. I was a little open, which means my shoulders were open before I even threw. So I definitely feel like there's more to come. Okay. A lot more to come. Well, there's another season to come. There's yes. a title defense yes. to come, yes. right? Yes, yes. It's going to be crazy. Um, in the finals, out of the nine people, only one person's graduating. Really? Yes. Everyone's back. Everyone. Do you have a rival? No, I love them all. Like, I feel like <laughs> throwers are just so nice. Yeah. Like, just super nice. So I was like, we're all, like, I asked anybody... Everyone, I was like, is anyone graduating? They're like, no. <laughs> like, oh, we'll crap. See you next year. Yes. I was like, see you next year. Wow. First field national championship in a field event in 30 years at BYU. Mm -hmm. uh, first ever to do it in the Javelin. What do those two things mean to you? Um, I didn't know that at first. They asked me that in an interview right after, and I was like, oh, I don't know. I don't know. But um, I know it means a lot to me because I put in the work. I put in a lot of work. And it also means a lot to my coach because – He's put in a lot of time, a lot of work of like building our throws program because it is hard to like recruit and everything. So for my coach, I knew it, it was just amazing for him. And I'm just happy I did it for him too. So. Okay. Is that who you're hugging in this video that we're yes. looking at right now? Yep. And then that's my dad. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes. So Happy Father's Day, dad. Yes. And it was their anniversary. It was my parents' anniversary that day. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. All right, we have to ask you this question because we're, we're hardened journalists. Have you ever speared anyone with your javelin? <laughs> okay, so yes, kind of. So we throw at a wall in the wintertime because it's too cold outside. So we throw at a wall and it bounces back at you if you're, not, if you're too close and not paying attention. So me and my um, teammate Paige, we threw and like I turned back and I was like, that was a good one. And they're like, they like start yelling, Ashton, and it comes in the back, like spears me in the back. Oh like, no. It got me in the back. You hit yourself? I hit myself. Oh. <laughs> you speared yourself? I was how, like, oh. Yeah, how bad was this? How bad of an injury? It, it wasn't okay. bad. It wasn't bad. I just think it's so funny. <laughs> and then what was the second one? Um, my friend Paige, my teammate Paige, did it she, as well. She's, she's still your friend? <laughs> yeah, she's still my friend. She's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, now during the break we were discussing, and we talked about this last time you visited Studio B. Uh, you being from Connell, Washington, yes. and uh, which is home of the Hadleys, Hadley brothers, Spencer and Matt, who yes. are great football players yes. here. Your dad coached them. Okay, yep. but you you've now you, you made it official. You're the best athlete to ever come out of Connell. Yes, I told Matt and Spence. I was like, sorry guys, I I took the title. I'm definitely the best that come out of Connell now. <laughs> How'd they react to that? I'm sure they <laughs> said, you're exactly right. Yes, they actually did say that. Matt's like, okay, yeah, you win. So, yeah. you're, I mean, it's crazy. I'm, I'm looking at these headlines that we have on the TV side right now. You know, national champion, uh, ranked number one. You were ranked number one heading into nationals. Um, you're obviously now number one official. What does that little number mean? When you see that, is it more pressure or is it more like, yeah, accomplishment? So there was a lot of pressure going in. Everyone's like, there's like a target on your back. Everyone says that. Oh, there's a target on your back. I didn't think That's of that. That's tough in the javelin. Yeah, yeah I mean, yeah. On your My guy. <laughs> <laughs> but but um, it was also like a lot of confidence. I was like, I'm number one. Like my averages are now their PRs. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, you have this. Like I instilled in myself, not scared, just confident. Okay, let's, let's revisit the numbers. And again, we did this last time. 
What's the next mark you're trying to hit? I want 62.19. That is Maggie Malone's um, um, national re- or NCAA record. 62 meters. Yes. And then 19. Is that so? Six, set, okay. 62.19. Is that what yes. we're going for? Yes. 62.19. Okay. Yes. Wow. Have you thrown that before? Like in a practice? I've gone close to it in practice, but not yet. But I, it's coming. I know okay. it's coming. Wow. Yes. What, what is it that gets you there when, when, um, when, when you've reached your peak, at least for this season as a national champion, but now you go back to practice and you go, how can I throw it further? I've thrown it further than anyone else. So now how can I throw it further than that? But is it, how do you even condition for that? Um, I'm in the weight room a lot. Like I would say, so I work out with my team which is an hour, and then me and my husband, Lane, yeah. we go to the gym for another you hour and a half. <laughs> yes, we love the gym. And then also a lot of technique. A lot of technical work goes into it. And so I have a lot of things to work on that will make me be a, a heck of a lot good thrower, better thrower. Okay. Yeah. I mean, do you watch, like, what kind of tape do you watch? Do you watch yourself more, or do you watch, you know, top-tier athletes? What's your film study like? Um, I watch both. I like to just... Um, go back to my 60 meter throw and I'm like, what did I do good on this? It looked so effortless. So I'll look at those and then I'll also watch Mackenzie Little. She's amazing. She was an NCAA champion as well. Um, I'll go look at her and just like watch their little things that I need to work on that they do really well. Sure. And that's what I find and try and execute those cues. Team took ninth place overall. Yeah. How, do you, how can you build on that for next season? What do you got coming behind you? Um, we have a lot of girls coming up. Um, I think we are going to get a few more girls to nationals next year in javelin. All of our girls are throwing amazing. We had five javelin thrower girls, just girls, go to um, regionals, and that's insane. So um, I think overall our whole team is going to be even better next year. Sadly, we're going to lose Courtney. Yeah, She's yeah. amazing, um, but we're building. <clears throat> we're definitely building. Okay, with the 62-19, just out of curiosity, would that put you in contention to make an Olympic team for the United States? I believe so, yeah. I mean, it's possible. Wow. <laughs> yes. Okay, so you're not, you're not far off is what we're getting at. Yes. So you might as well go for that. Yes, I will. I want to go for that, yes. Man, what a story. There'll be a day when, when the U.S. Olympic team is just full of BYU cougars. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, we're, we're pacing for that. Seriously, yes. Right? And, and yeah. then throw in Ashley Hatch and some of the others on the soccer team, and you got... You got a you got a group. This is there's an overarching uh, theme here. It's BYU women's athletics. Yeah. Like yes. and I, I'm not kidding. Like it yeah. has been a remarkable year specific to the women's sports, you know, and it started with women's soccer going to the national yeah. championship, women's volleyball doing their thing, making another Sweet you know, 16. Yeah, Sweet 16, which has just become the status quo for them. Yeah. Women's basketball had their best record uh, ever in program history. And then track and field. Like, Gymnastics, too. Gymna- uh, top yeah. 20 team there. What, We're killing it. What's the deal? What's going on, Ashton? I don't know, honestly. <laughs> We're just doing super good um, in the locker room. It's it's fun in the locker room because we all share a locker room. And... Like you pass by everyone, we're like, you guys are having a heck of a season to everyone because everyone's having a heck of a season, you know? Yeah. So the locker room's really fun and yeah, everyone's yeah. super nice. And You have a great season. Have yes. You have a great yes. season. Have you your have friends go in season. first now, say national champions coming in and then you can walk in. <laughs> <laughs> That'll set you apart from everyone else in the locker room. Oh, gosh. Ashton, congratulations. Thank you. We'll talk to you again soon, I'm sure. This is the best of BYU Sports Nation on BYU Radio. The best of BYU Sports Nation collects our favorite conversations and brings them to you every Saturday. This is BYU Sports Nation. He is Jason. I am Jerem. Let's why, whip it. Why aren't you Jerem? Jason Born Identity. The Cougar Whip Round is presented by Marisk, your integrated container logistics company enabling global trade for a growing world. In my secondary on my mission, they Elder Jordan! Hey, Jordan! <laughs> That's what they yelled at. <laughs> okay. Scoutwire released a mock draft. Can't get enough mock drafts, by the way. Any sport, doesn't matter. I just need a mock Any draft. Any sport. Any sport, I just really? want a mock draft. Yeah, I'll give you a Major League Rugby uh, <laughs> mock draft. Uh, Scout Wire released a mock draft where Jaron Hall went in the first round to the New York football Giants. How awesome would it be if BYU had two starting quarterbacks sharing a stadium in New York, technically New Jersey? Dude, six, two, overall pick. Uh, that would be incredible. Can you imagine? And then the Book of Mormon being the number one play on Broadway. We just we just take over. <laughs> Blake Freeland to the Bills in that mock as well, which is pretty awesome. That would be unbelievable. Look, I look. don't even care what team he's on. 
the Giants actually can win, as we've seen. Well, and the Giants, let's be honest, Daniel Jones is not long for the starting yeah. spot. They're going to be looking for a quarterback. They're looking for a quarterback. That's absolutely right. Yeah, I, I and in this mock, he's the third QB tech. I'd take that, man. Yeah, absolutely. Stuart Mandel releases Kings and Barons rankings, where he put the team in, teams into four categories, Kings, Barons, Knights, Peasants. This BYU is a knight fighting for honor and glory. Do you agree? Sure. <laughs> You and I both I, don't play chess. No, I've never played chess. I have no plans to ever play chess. Never been explained to me. I've never yeah, I, I don't, either. I know, yeah. I don't get it. I don't know. Yeah. Next. So, eh. Eh. All right, last Ping. night. Yeah. Un- L- checkmate. Yeah, checkmate. That's really all I know in that you like you take one of them and knock the other one over. Yep. I, yeah. I've seen Harry Potter, so I totally know what Very I'm Very passive now. aggressive. Yeah. yeah. Tink. Yeah. Last night, the U.S. men's soccer team played a CONCACAF game versus El Salvador in some pretty terrible game field conditions. What's the worst weather game in BYU football history? Two came to mind for me. Yeah, 2014 Texas was crazy. That wasn't even during the game. That was pregame. Yeah. Um, I I was the countdown to kickoff producer, and so we did a three-hour pregame. That was fun. Uh, at one point, the uh, the managing director came up behind me, the big boss, and he said, are we still on the air? I said, oh, yes. Uh, for, for three hours, baby. That's the one that comes to mind. 03 Utah as well. The snowball. Yeah, those are the two that stood out to me. First was the, the Texas game because of the weather. And again, it was not necessarily during the game, but it was the fact that the game was pushed an hour or two uh, because of just horror. And we do not get thunderstorms like that yes. here in Utah. That's Midwest type stuff. So Texas clearly yep. brought that stuff with them. Yes. 20- and, and in 2003, the snowball, and then obviously the, the end was just horrible. 2017, Portland State was 110 on the field. It felt like 110. Lauren McLean, the sideline reporter, had a heat stroke. So Blaine came up from the booth. I to remember do the that. You're game. right. You're crazy. right. BYU Stats Man tweeted out a picture of a BYU season ticket from 1936, which, which cost a whopping 355. <laughs> can you get anything from the concession stands at Lavelle Edwards Stadium right now for that amount? I don't know what you can get for. Th- I, you can't even get it. One gallon of gas, you cannot even get for 355. No, it's five bucks right now, which is. Yeah, I, I don't know. I'll, I will take that. Though. Three dollars. You know what? If that's hey, if look that's at the right. schedule, by the way. Montana State, Utah Aggies. You mean yeah. Utah State? The Colorado, Colorado Mines, Mines and then Wyoming. And Wyoming. Wyoming. What a home schedule! That home schedule stunk. Who was the AD that put that one together? Wyoming probably hated us back then too. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right. BYU announced national anthem auditions will be on July 8th at the Marriott Center. Will you be auditioning for that? Uh, no, but I'm hoping Spence is. Yeah. Uh, I will not be auditioning, but I, I do you have this. Just audition now? I have had this. I've had this thought in my head like a lot. Like. It, all of the events that we go to, yes. let's say that somebody who was supposed to sing the national anthem can't, and then I step up and sing it. I, for whatever reason, I wait, have this thought wait, all like the time. You, like you want to? Like what I would do probably mean? do that. Like if they were in a jam, yeah. And the person that like they didn't hey, have it. Hey, I athletics, would, create I a would jam. step up and sing the national anthem. <laughs> and I'm not a singer, but I would do that. It's what? weird how often I think of that scenario That's playing out. I like that. I can't wait to see a women's soccer game where you do. <laughs> a man who impersonates Clay Thompson physically to the point of dressing up, signing autographs, and so on, got on the court before Game Five of the NBA Finals and put up shots for 10 minutes before the Chase Center banned him for life in the NBA. Shep, has anyone ever thought that you were on the baseball team? Like they mistook you for someone on the team? Um, when I travel with the team, because like we're in travel sweats, so I blend in that way. So, oh, so that team issue. But, but, uh, but like during games, I get coach a lot, which is kind of odd because the coaches don't wear like a polo and they and actually pants. have a number. They actually yeah, have a jersey. but I, I get coach a lot. I want you to get a jersey and have a number. The best of BYU Sports Nation will be back after this on BYU Radio. This is the best of BYU Sports Nation on BYU Radio. Well, uh, welcome back to BYU Sports Nation. From Arizona to BYU to North Carolina to D.C. to Team USA, Ashley Hatch has been doing work for a while on the pitch and off it. And now she's coming to Utah for a friendly with Columbia coming up in a couple of weeks. Here's Ashley with Spencer and I earlier this week. It's a wonderful thing to have Ashley Hatch on BYU Sports Nation. And especially when she's playing soccer in the Beehive State again. She did so at a very high level for BYU. Now she's with Team USA competing at Rio Tinto Stadium on June 28th. Ashley, it's great to have you back. How are you? I'm great. How are you guys? 
Uh, we're just looking forward that to what's going to happen at the end of this month. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> Team USA, Colombia, Rio Tinto, how are you feeling about all of this? Uh, I'm great. I'm on cloud nine. I'm super excited for the opportunity to come back to Utah and play in front of y'all. It's going to be awesome because let's let's flash back to when you were making your debut with the U.S. and you got in, you got your first cap Rio Tinto. That was awesome. Times have changed here. You have grown as a player and a person. Take us through sort of the journey you've been on since that first cap to now this uh, next appearance in Utah. Man, yeah, it's been quite a journey. I've definitely developed more as a player and as a person. I have a lot more experience under my belt. Um, I've definitely fine-tuned a few of my skills as a forward. And, yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to stepping onto that field um, with a little bit more confidence. <laughs> okay. Yeah, let's, uh, let's dive into that a little bit more. Uh, walk me through how you feel playing for Team USA emotionally now compared to the feelings you had during that first appearance with Team USA? Oh, man. Um, I, when I My first appearance, you know, I was super nervous, like just kind of like in shock that I was actually going to be able to have an opportunity to step on the field at Rio Tinto in front of a lot of my family and friends and BYU teammates and stuff. Um, now having a little bit more experience under my belt, still nervous, but just like super honored for the opportunity to be able to go out there, play with more confidence and to be able to contribute more um, to the team and, you know, help them win. I feel like before, you know, I was just, you know, like kind of a filler, like, Hey, go out there, have fun <laughs> kid, but you know, don't get too comfortable. You're not there yet. Um, and now it's kind of like, Hey, you know, you have a lot more experience, a lot more to offer this team. So like, let's go out and contribute. So definitely two different um, scenarios, but I'm excited. And these are friendlies. These are, uh, you know, tune ups. You have one uh, June 26th in Colorado. And then of course in Sandy on the 28th, you guys got to, uh, you know, qualify for the World Cup, New Zealand and Australia, which is super exciting next year. So what's kind of the mindset right now as you prepare for some very important matches? Um, just, you know, getting ready, staying healthy mentally, physically, spiritually. Like it's going to be um, quite a camp. You know, we've got these two friendlies and then going to qualifiers. Like it's going to be very demanding. So just getting before camp, just getting myself mentally and physically prepared, staying healthy, um, you know, being in my best possible shape going into the camp. And then, you know, getting into camp, just contributing and doing our best with our time together to prepare for all these games. Ashley Hatch is on BYU Sports Nation. What type of role are you anticipating that you will play for Team USA in these friendlies and moving forward? That's a great question. Um, I will play whatever role they need me to play. Um, but I'm, I don't know. I'm hoping to be able to come in and contribute um, with whatever minutes I am given, um, whether that's a start or coming off the bench, and then, and then obviously just contributing in the attack and helping them score goals and win games. Now, for the Rio Tinto uh, appearance, uh, your friends and family have organized a tailgate here. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, so you know our friend Cam from Bam Bams. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we've, uh, te we've teamed up with him to have this charity tailgate, and all the proceeds are going to Journey of Hope, an organization that's helping women from all walks of life to um, just get back up on their feet. Um, they help a lot of women you know, recover from domestic abuse, violence, coming out of the prison system. They help women just from all walks of life, like I said. So it's a great opportunity for us to help them with some donations, but also to raise awareness for any women who are going through uh, some trauma like this, that there is a pl there's a place for them, especially at Journey of Hope, if they need help with their current situation. So we're really excited to kind of like bring these two great organizations together and have some fun and raise some funds. So how do people donate or attend if, uh, the tailgate if they want to? So the tailgate, I think, is going to be on the east side of parking lot at Rio Tinto. Um, I'll definitely post more on my Instagram in the coming days. Um, but we're just asking for uh, at least a $12 donation to get some uh, good barbecue. And they can obviously donate more. But, yeah, just come to the tailgate, um, bring some, you know, change and enjoy the barbecue and – have fun with fam my family and friends will be there. I won't be there. Um, but yeah, just come early to the game. Then you go in the stadium and then you hang out with you. Exactly. Right? That's the idea. Yeah, yeah. You go to the yeah exactly. Yeah. 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 Buy a ticket. Come watch. <laughs> <Exactly. laughs> yeah. And listen, if Cameron Bam Bam True is involved, the barbecue will be taken care of. That's oh, for sure. So good. Now, exactly. We, now I'm, I'm told that 
10,000 tickets have been sold for the match already. Uh, and That's I awesome. believe that, mm-hmm. what, like 9,500 of those are to the Hatch family? Is is that accurate? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. We, we bought them all out. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be an awesome game, and uh, you know Columbia is a great uh, opponent there as well. Tell us what it's been like in the NWSL to interact with former Cougars as well, because you've kind of been the the solo uh, banner carrier here for a minute, but now Cam Tucker <laughs> with Gotham FC, and of course the Ola- Orlando Pride with Michaela Coolahan. You've faced off with them a couple times. Were there jersey swaps? Were there pictures taken? Uh, no, but there was like hugs exchanged for sure. Nice. <laughs> it was. It's always fun to see you know, fellow Cougars in the league. Um, and to see how well they're doing and it's it's when they're not playing against me I'm cheering them on <laughs> so <laughs> it's fun to to follow them in their careers as well oh Ashley you already mentioned the foundation that you're teaming up with uh, Bam Bam's barbecue in to help uh, all of those women but you have made significant strides in equalizing a sport that for a long time was not paid equally and and man it has been a journey but you've gotten to the point where the national women's soccer team and the men's national soccer team are essentially paid the same. What does that mean to you to have been a part of that? Um, it's huge. I mean, I can't take a, I can't take as much credit as all the veterans who put in so much time negotiating in the CBA and just advocating for us and, you know, equal pay and all that. But to be able to be a part of a league who just got their CBA and then now the national team who just solidified another great CBA for us moving forward is huge. And I'm super excited for the future of women's soccer and for obviously for us to get compensated, you know, more and also for the future of the girls that come behind us. So it's huge. And I'm really excited with the direction that we're going. You've also been in the news with the uh, Washington DC temple uh, rededication and taking your teammates on a tour of the temple. You made it in the church news. Nice. Uh, what, what was that experience like, not only with your teammates, but with the uh, temple rededication? That's always a cool experience. Yeah, definitely. It's been honestly an experience that like it's really hard to explain. It was such a unique experience being able to take my teammates to the temple um, and just help them uh, understand a little bit why I am the way I am and why I believe the things I believe. And um, it was it was really cool. It was really fun. Um, the dedication, they actually pushed back the open house for another month because there was such high demand oh, of wow. people going through. So the, so the dedication is ha- now happening in August. So I'm hoping to also be a part of that as well. But it's been such a unique experience. I mean, I have already I went through three or four times the open house. <laughs> so they're probably like, all right, you've been here enough. Like, let someone else come through. <laughs> That's awesome. No, go as many times as you want, right? My dad is a kid growing up <laughs> yeah. in Virginia, North Carolina. That was his temple, right? That's where he went. That's where a lot yeah. of people on the East Coast went for a long time. So that's really cool. Mm-hmm. And I hadn't heard that they pushed it back. I mean, that kind of demand is, yeah. uh, that's what you want, I suppose, yeah. right? Yeah, it's awesome. The fabulous Ashley Hatch is on BYU Sports Nation. You're back to your old antics, scoring a bunch of goals in the National Women's Soccer League. You've got four goals and eight appearances with Team USA. Does the golden boot and reclaiming it for another year drive you in any way? H- how do you manage the expectations <laughs> or once you've won it and are trying to win it again? That's a great question. And, you know, I'm currently trying to figure that out. I think you always, once you, you know, kind of get a taste of what it's like to be, you know, claim the golden boot, you want to get it again. Um, but I also think it's just, you know, managing myself and making sure that I'm doing everything I can in my, in my sphere of influence and just like as a player, just continuing to improve and move in that direction. And if I, if I do that, things like the golden boot, you know, are more likely to happen. Um, but yeah, I mean, of course I want it again, but you know, we'll see what happens. Would you prefer to score a goal with your foot, with the boot or with your head? Because you've done both a lot at a high level. Uh, to be honest, I don't really care how it goes in. As long as it goes in, I'm happy. (laughs) You looked happy against Australia on the header. Uh, so yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And then let's finish with this. Obviously you're building towards trying to make a spot on the World Cup roster, what will it take for you and how many forwards do they typically keep? Um, That's a great question. I feel like they keep um, at least, you know, we have three, uh, at least hopefully six, probably four to six forwards. I'm not really sure, Um, but it's definitely going to take, you know, me 
being consistent, um, staying healthy, staying in good shape and good form, doing well in the league and obviously continuing to score goals. So I feel like if I can do those things, then I will make a good case for myself. (laughs) Yes, indeed. Once upon a time, Jerem, I remember a shy little Ashley Hatch as a freshman at BYU (laughs) Soft-spoken, not saying much. You've never been soft-spoken. Now you're That's controlling bloody. the narrative. Now you're making demands you're and getting about. them. Maybe off the <laughs> pitch, on the pitch, you've always talked. Come on. I love it. I That's love true. it. <laughs> Ashley, it's great to catch up with you. Send our best to all of your family. We can't wait to see you on June 28th in Rio Tinto. Looking forward to it. And take some BYU Sports Nation karma, why don't you? Let's do our part. Oh, thank you. Love it. Always. <laughs> the best of BYU Sports Nation. We'll be right back. Rise and shout for the trending topics of the week here on the best of BYU Sports Nation. All rise and shout. It's time for What's Trending. You're talking about it, and so are we. It's What's Trending on BYU Sports Nation. What's Trending is presented by Bodyguards, protection for a life worth living. Learn more at bodyguards.com. As mentioned, Major League Soccer inked a $2.5 billion billion deal with Apple TV, which is a game changer because finally somebody gave a top five league in the U.S. the primary rights to a streaming platform. So what does this mean for BYU and the Big 12? Currently, the TV deal runs through 2024 with ESPN and Fox. In 2025, the league will have a new deal without Texas and Oklahoma. Not sure exactly who or what that's going to look like, but hopefully it's lots and lots of dollars. Shep, how does the MLS deal impact BYU's future TV deals in the Big 12? What are your thoughts on this? Well, I mean, today, I don't know if there is a direct correlation between the two, but I think what it does give us is another example of the trends that are happening in sports broadcasting. You know, the, the, if you're still on the fence on whether or not you're going to purchase streaming options to watch sports, you're over 70 years old. You're probably going to miss out on most sports moving forward. Yeah. And so this is just another example of where this industry is going. And look, for the most part, you know, we talk about cord cutters and things like that. Obviously, Major League Baseball has its option to stream games, out-of-market games. You have the NFL Sunday Ticket, which is in all likelihood going to be leaving DirecTV and going somewhere else, possibly a streaming option. I mean, you've heard Amazon is an option. Who knows? Maybe Apple jumps in on that with Jump along, with, yeah, along with the they, MLS. They do an MLB game yes. on Friday night. So, so I mean, this is, this is the way things are going, and – I would not be surprised if when we get time for whatever the new television rights deal is, it's going to be heavily influenced by streaming. Now, obviously, there's still going to be some sort of terrestrial platform to watch this stuff on TV on one of the networks. That's where the real money still yes, is. Yes, yeah. but there's going to be more and more streaming options. That's just the way it is. And so, like I said, if, if you're still like, I don't want to – bite into this right now that's just if you if you want to watch these games moving forward that's just reality you always had it pretty nice the last uh 11 years let's talk about it uh espn espn 2 espn plus a little bit of espn plus right espn U, uh byu tv free 90 free baby uh we plan on being that way for a while i would think um that's pretty easy and accessible you can kind of have two apps and get most of the games not every game but most of the games the rights uh, for BYU typically have been home-based because BYU has been independent. In the Big 12, that's going to be all conference games are going to be under certain TV rights. Football might be negotiated separately from the other sports. We'll see. Um, but you are right. This is going to streaming platforms. Now, when we say it's on ESPN, ESPN Plus, you, you have some familiarity with that brand. Uh, you expect a certain amount of quality. When it's Apple TV... That's different. That is different. Right? Um, it, it's it's just like if Netflix took it up or Amazon, where it's not a terrestrial channel. You can't get the rabbit ears to work. You can't – it's it's not your traditional satellite and whatnot. It's streaming. And the cord cutting thing, that phrase is probably even a couple of years ago because it's like yeah. most people have done that to some degree. Yes. I've done it. Yeah. what do, And you use I, – I have YouTube TV. I do as well currently. Um, so the, it will the Big 12 go to a streaming platform? We don't know. I will be surprised if they do, though. 
I think they'll stick. They'll try their best to be exposed as best uh, as possible because it's not just about money. It's about being actually seen as well because you want to be on in every bar in America, every Chili's, every airport, restaurant, right? You want your league and teams to be seen, but you also want the most money with that. So I don't know what the aims of the Big 12 are relative to this, but I would hope that it'd be that. Now, don't forget... (laughs) <laughs> that the ESPN, uh, ESPN and the Big 12 actually got into a bit of a tiff when Texas and Oklahoma were rumored to be plucked. Bob Bowlesby sent a cease and desist to ESPN, its TV primary rights holder, um, about uh, getting out of the way and stop uh, you know, uh, cannibalizing those, those two entities and the league. Because there was talk of ESPN, a rumor of ESPN trying to get some of the other teams to leave the league and sort of blow up the Big 12 with the deal. Cease and desist. So it's not like it's all roses and sunshine between the league and ESPN. But I will be surprised if ESPN and Fox and some combination of that isn't what BYU uh, and the Big 12 hopefully have in 2025. They will probably negotiate that. Well, they can start as soon as they want. They know Texas and Oklahoma are leaving. They know the AAC 3 and BYU are in. We'll see what that contract looks like and where – BYU's games are going to be on. Okay, so let's focus on what the next couple of seasons will be like. Obviously, this one more year of, of status quo in Dude, terms of what uh, – for yeah. BYU. Yes. This, this upcoming season, everything yes. is what you've typically been used to in terms of yes, being man. able to watch BYU UAT, sports. Yep. So then moving into the first year as a Big 12 – Two years. But you, you know what? I'm Moving yeah. into that first year – Let's focus on that because Bob Bowlesby. It's still ESPN and Fox. Yes, but Bob Bowlesby yeah. had mentioned just for BYU games. Yeah. Obviously, football is going. You're going to have those games yep. on on you know yep. stations that you that you have access to. Uh, but for say women's soccer and baseball and volleyball, all, the stuff all those we things cover. Bob Bowlesby had mentioned the number fifty. Now, whether or not fifty is like the exact number, I mean, all that stuff is being talked about, and you know, that's that's all behind the scenes stuff that's that's being discussed and will continue to be discussed. But I, I think that that's interesting that you could have up to that many games that you will need to have a subscription for in order to watch Big Twelve now, mm-hmm. which is sort of the branding of the league on ESPN Correct. Plus. Correct. So like if you if, just if you, yeah. if you just wanted ESPN Plus, four ninety nine a month. It's not it's not it's not anything major. Re, you're already giving ten percent probably if so, you're watching the show. Now but now look, let's be perfectly honest. I think most of us in this boat that want to watch BYU probably are also fans of Disney. Disney Plus. So you can bundle it and you're spending fourteen ninety nine <laughs> and I know that because I see it on my credit card statement every month. Yes, this audience is a very Disney Plus. So I'm audience, going to assume there's going yes. to be far more bundles than just solo ESPN. So, so much bundling. Um so back to the fifty you mentioned. So Bob Bowlesby mentioned when asked, I believe by Mitch Harper of KSL Sports, uh, you know, what's BYU TV's role in the new Big 12? 50 games from each team in the league of its other sports, Correct. basically. So what that means is, and this is still being discussed and determined is, perhaps BYU TV will do the other games uh, after that. Men's volleyball, the exception, not in the Big 12. We can do all those games, no problem. Um, so, yeah, we'll, we'll see what that means. And then uh, I, I had this question come to my mind, Shep. What, what matters more to you? And I almost mean you, plural, and you. And I, and I know the answer is one way, but I want uh, us to think about this. The con- what matters more to you? The convenience of being able to watch BYU athletics, or do you want BYU athletics to get the most money possible, but maybe be a little inconvenient to, or less convenient than ESPN? Now, the answer for the majority of the audience is going to be the convenience for me. Um, but that is what, a horrible question to ask at 10, 14 a.m. when we're getting ready to go to break. But what, because that is a great question. But what if BYU Athletics benefits in a way in facilities and uh, budgets and personnel and staffs in a way that if, if they get 10 more million a year somewhere else, that's a li- like let's say it's Apple TV, then what? Then what? It's been pretty nice the last uh, 10 years uh, plus with ESPN, right? So we'll plus. see. Plus, Ten there years you go. Plus, there we go. Our question of the day: How willing are you to pay for a streaming service to watch BYU games? That includes ESPN Plus or others in the future, right? Uh, let's hear from you in Voice of the Nation. This is the Voice of the Nation on BYU Sports Nation. Weigh in on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Mr. Daniel Q2 on Twitter. 
On a scale of 1 to 10, my willingness is every bit of 14. There you go. <laughs> I think this is a no-brainer in an age where streaming services are measured or a measuring stick for how committed people are to the content they consume for BYU Sports content. I'm fully committed. Uh, at 3M Mickey on Twitter. I'm all in, whatever it takes. At jfloyd314 on Twitter. If there was a one-stop shop location for all live BYU sports, name your price. That will never happen. The prospects of never again seeing a game on ESPNU or ESPN Plus would be worth the money by itself. Now, I disagree to uh, uh, s- some degree because ESPNU is still going to be better than FS2 if you're relegated to the second channel there. Uh, ESPN Plus. Now I, could, now, I could see that where it's like, oh, this isn't on linear TV, but there's not really a difference anymore yeah, yeah. of it being on. I'm, I'm, not, I'm talking the accessibility of watching a stream. I'm not talking about the viewership. Obviously, the viewership is down if it's not on ESPN, ESPN2, right? There's a difference. FS1, good channel to be on. Those are the big three for the league right now. I think most people are going to be willing to do, within reason, with, and everybody's situation is different from a financial and standpoint. if it's Apple TV, it's one spot, But, but I, I think Honestly, I think people are going to be willing to pay in order to watch because I, that they're fans of BYU You'll and they want it. to watch. Well, look, look You'll do I ended it. up signing up for a, a far inferior streaming platform. Say it out loud. What is it? To we don't watch, have a sponsor to here to watch for them. jazz games this last year because jazz Bebo. games were not on YouTube TV. Yeah. I spent an extra seventy dollars a month just so that I could watch jazz games. Yeah, I'm gonna be streaming whatever I need to to watch games. That's yeah. just the way it is. If you yeah, if you love that team, I think you'll do it. If you just like the team, maybe not. Right. This is the best of BYU Sports Nation on BYU Radio. Hear what the coaches, athletes, and experts have to say. Here's another great interview from the week on the best of BYU Sports Nation. We've got Dallin Hall fresh off the mish, what, uh, like nine days ago or something? A, a week and a half ago or something? Yeah, coming up on two. Okay, that's awesome. Well, are you welcome still in the man. weird? Is it still weird? Are you or, weird, man? Or is it, like, have you acclimated fairly quickly? Last week was pretty weird, but this week's really <laughs> What was what was the weirdest thing about coming home here? Um, I felt pretty like I just wanted someone to tell me what to do all week. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're at BYU. Just wait. <laughs> just wait. You'll be just fine. Uh, but how, how's it been, man? Fresno. I know you got called to what? The Philippines? Yep. Uh, but you were in Fresno the whole two years. Yeah. Um, it was part of God's plan for me. And I had some amazing experiences out there that confirmed that and I love Fresno now. <laughs> and, and there's a more, more opportunity to play basketball in Fresno probably than uh, the Philippines, so that's a blessing too, right? Yeah. How much basketball were you able to play? Lots. <laughs> <laughs> Seems like everywhere I went, every missionary wanted to play basketball. So did we you? would do that for morning workouts and every P day for a couple hours. Did, did, I've got to imagine the competitive juices. Like I realize that you're out there as a, as a missionary, but you, you got some skills. So, I mean, it, it was it, you still wanting to be competitive out there, right? Yeah, it was good. Everyone wanted to to play, and yeah, sometimes it gets heated. <laughs> so here's what I want to know. Who is more excited to see you at the airport, mom and dad or Coach Pope? <laughs> <laughs> definitely mom, definitely mom, and then I think Coach Pope and then dad. <laughs> nice. I, he cracked the top two, which is <laughs> cool. We're talking to Dallin Hall, uh, uh, Gatorade Player of the Year in the state of Utah, Mr. Basketball, here on BYU Sports Nation, uh, back home from a mission. Is it still a rule to play? You can only play half court. You'd yeah. think I'd know, <laughs> but I have no clue. In, in our mission, it was. I'm not sure for gotcha. everywhere else. Half court, to me, is the purest form of the game. Let me tell you why. Because the lazy people <laughs> don't get up and down, right? <laughs> you can take advantage of full court transition, but when you're young, you're running around. At our age, I'm going to group myself in with Shep, which is well, rare. We're the same age. I don't know why you wouldn't. So <laughs> something, that's fine. something like that. Uh, <laughs> yes, you can take advantage of transition. So in the half court, what were you able to work on, I guess, uh, in the half court game, oh, that's a good question. Um, probably just step back threes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, um, it's a little different missionary basketball. You don't <laughs> yes, it jump is. as much with guys coming underneath you and stuff. But I don't know. It was really fun just playing with guys you love and care for. And step back three is basically all I shot. <laughs> Did you have a, a companion who was a particularly good rebounder? Did you find <laughs> one that was like a willing re- rebounder? Um, I had a couple, yeah, that, like two that, and then they also really wanted to learn the game, and so that right. was fun. 
And then my last comp- one of my last companions, he's a really good basketball player from Hawaii. Nice. And so that was really fun. Very cool. How much basketball have you played since coming home? I've, I've got to assume you've, you've been in the gym with the teammates. Like, what, what has that part been like since coming back, getting back in the swing of things from a BYU basketball standpoint? Yeah, it's been really good. Coach Pope has um, wanted me to slowly ease in so I don't overdo things at the start, and that's been a challenge in itself. Um, but it's been really fun, and I feel like, Right now, I'm just slowly getting more and more time, sh- getting shots up and in the weight room doing a lot of body weight stuff. But That's going to be really hard, as you've talked about, because it takes so long. Like, it really does, just to get that body back. That's the, the, the ultimate sacrifice is the time you give, obviously. But then the sort of for a D1 athlete, it's the physical nature of that. So what, what's the ne- what are the next few months, year going to look like for you as you try and get back and because I know you want to contribute this year, of course, uh, with the season coming up in five months. Yeah, uh, I hope to get on the floor a lot this year. And right now it's just not overdoing it so that I have a healthy body this year. And um, I don't know. I got some amazing coaches that are going to help me get to where I need to be. And so if I can keep continuing to stay healthy, hopefully I'll see some, some time on the floor this year and it should be fun. I've been really interested to ask you this question because it has to be a little strange being detached at the time when all this was going down. But when you committed to BYU, BYU's future was in the WCC. That is no longer the case. This all this Big 12 stuff was not even a thing when you originally committed. So you're out on your mission when all of this happens. How did you find out that BYU was going to the Big 12? And what's your reaction heading into such a dominant basketball conference in another season? Yeah, uh, my mom told me on my preparation day on a Monday, and I was pumped. Uh, You always want to play against the best as a competitor, and when I found out we were going to the Big 12 and the teams that are in there, the environments you're playing in, I mean, that's what every kid dreams of growing up, so I'm super pumped to play against the best and to beat the best. Like, before BYU actually got in the Big 12, I think I always thought the uh, uh, ACC was the best basketball league. It's actually the Big 12. Like, metrics show this, you know, and, and so it's like, oh, my gosh, what are we getting into? This is going to be awesome. This journey is going to be fun. We're talking to Dallin Hall on BYU Sports Nation. Um, what what are you – yeah, what are you hoping for this year as you transition back? Because it's a senior-laden backcourt, um, yet the, it's you and Richie and Tanner as return missionaries hoping to get your foot in the door a little bit there. Yeah. Um, I would say I'm going to fulfill whatever role they give me and – I'm hoping to to get as many minutes as I can out there. I, nothing's given in college basketball. You know that when you're coming in. But hopefully I can can get on the floor, and it's every person's goal to start. So I'm just going to work my hardest and see how it plays out. Well, you're part of of the core that's that's going to be what this program is for the foreseeable future. The, the last year in the WCC and then entering into the Big 12 – what does that mean to you to be a part of that core that will sort of set the tone for the next couple of years? It's special. It's exciting. And we have a, a very big opportunity here. And so I'm excited to make the most of it. And I know that we can have a huge impact on the history of BYU basketball. So with the, the guys we have and the coaching staff we have, I know we can do something special. Uh, Colin Chandler's, t- what, two years younger than you, I believe, right? Yeah. But a, but a Davis County guy nonetheless. Did you know him at all, despite the age difference? Yeah, he actually played with my little brother all growing up. My dad coached him. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, so so you know him. Close family friends. And he's he's blossomed in an amazing way and been this big-time recruit that's going on his mission, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, so you, perhaps your junior year. Yeah. Uh, you and Colin <laughs> connecting in the Big 12. That feels like a long ways away, though, right? <laughs> and you're just like... Back from a mission. It's like this. On a mission. <laughs> but it does happen. Okay, um, when, when you look at the next, like this next season, obviously you were gone for this last season, but Alex Barcelo and Tijon Lucas out, it's a different kind of team. The, still, the team's still being put together. Who do you know from before your mission in, in recruiting interactions or whatever? And, and are, you, are you guys wearing name tags to get to know each other's name? Like, what's it like right now? Um, <clears throat> I think the only people I really knew before was Trevin Nell and Trey Stewart. And now I'm just getting to know all the guys. I love them already. Foose, T, uh, Richie. It's, re- it's been really cool. We don't wear name tags, but 
We, uh, you've been had, wearing, you've been wearing been name tags. Enough. enough name yeah. tags. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm a member of the basketball team <laughs> at BYU. Uh, are, are you in spring or uh, summer classes right now? What's the uh, academic situation right now? Yeah, I'm jumping in the 21st with a couple classes, summer bridge. The start of college. I never took summer class, so I can't give you any advice. But, <laughs> but good luck. I know it's condensed. Yeah. Thank you. Explain your game to people for those that, that maybe weren't able to see what you were able to accomplish in high school. What, what, explain your game and what you bring to BYU. Yeah, for sure. So I think as a, as a basketball player, I've always just tried to make the right play to make the game easy. And I think I just try and make people around me better. And so I'm not really that point guard that's just going to shoot every time he gets the ball. A lot of these clips you'll see, I shoot the ball. <laughs> but <laughs> We're um, not going to show the highlights <laughs> where you pass the ball. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm more of a I create for my teammates, and I love being surrounded by shooters, and that's what we have here at the Y. And so um, just making the right play each time so that the defense can't just focus on one thing. One of the things that I remember from you was obviously – um, in the in the state championship game where Donovan Mitchell afterwards sought you out and, and wanted to talk to you and was impressed with your game and was tweeting about you. How cool was that, by the way? That was super cool. That was a big-time move by him. He's a great guy for the community here, and that was just a dream. I didn't even know what to say to him, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> Feels like a long time ago, but um, that was really cool for him to, to take the time to speak to me, to give me some advice, and to, to help me on my path. So I appreciate that a lot. Now, uh, a friend of ours, Steve Cleveland, uh, is a guy who's done a ton of great work in Fresno. Still living there, right? Yep. Did you interact with Steve? Yep. Okay, tell, tell us about your interactions there. Okay, yeah, Coach Cleveland, he's a he's You a call him Coach, I love it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he took us out to lunch one time, gave me some advice on coming back in, and he told me a little bit about his coaching history here and how he coached Paul George, and I thought that was super cool, but... He's a great guy and um, an even better person, and I'm grateful for what he taught me out there. He was a mission president himself in the basketball mecca, Indianapolis. Like, yeah. And the, I think the Final Four might have been there yeah, no, during one of the it three was, years, yes. right? Yeah. Well, I think, was it during COVID? Was he there during that? It was but, before that. Yeah, okay. But, oh, my gosh. the Inspired to Indiana, right? The Hoosier State. Let's go, man. Well, sweet. Uh, thanks for coming in uh, studio. We appreciate the time, man. Do you mind signing our flag here during the break? Absolutely. Yeah, right. we'll, we'll, get okay. you, we'll get you the, we'll sharpie, get you the sharpie once we go to break, and you can sign the, uh, the flag anywhere you'd like. And best of luck uh, not going too hard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like two weeks off of Mish. Thanks for coming in, Dallas. Thanks, Thanks Dallas. We'll be right back with more of the best of BYU Sports Nation. The best of BYU Sports Nation collects our favorite conversations and brings them to you every Saturday. All rise and shout. It's time for What's Trending. You're talking about it, and so are we. It's What's Trending on BYU Sports Nation. All right, we touched on this just a second ago. BYU football has had quite the two-year stretch in terms of victories. In 2020, the Cougars went 11-1. and We all remember uh, how close they were to going undefeated in that season. Just a remarkable year. And then last year, BYU was 10-3. and So if we are in store for another 10-win season this year, well, actually, before we go any further, let's get to today's stat of the day. It'll help explain it. It's the BYU Sports Nation stat of the day. BYU has won 10-plus games three seasons in a row, three times in BYU history. So to finish the thought that I was just mentioning, if BYU were to reach 10 wins this year, Dave, it would be just the fourth time in BYU football history that the Cougars would have won 10 or more games in three straight years. Pretty the good. other stretches, these are the times where it's happened before. 79 through 81, 83 through 85, and then 06 through 09, so obviously that's a four-year stretch. Dave, which 10-win season streak to you is most impressive? Let's roll out the numbers, and because I think this is a great debate. Uh, let's go to 1979 through 1981. 79 with Mark Wilson, they went 11-1, and 13th in the AP poll. 
in 80 with Jim McMahon. They went 12 and 1, first 12 win season, finished number 12. That was the theme of that season and beat to SMU with the Hail Mary. 81, they went 11 and 2, finished number 13. So that's 34 wins, 4 and 1 against the P5s, and those two of those four uh, five P5 games were in bowl games. So not much in the regular seasons, but those were great teams and they won a lot of games. Go to 83 and 85, as Steve Young laments, they lost to Baylor <laughs> to open up 83. Then they go 11 and 1, finish number 7, win the national championship in 84, 13 and 0. They come back, Robbie wasn't healthy with his shoulder, they still won 11 games, finished number 16, so that's 35 wins, 7 and 3 against the P5s with three of those games in bowl games. 2006 to 2009, shout out to David Nixon. Uh, Cougars won four years in a row, winning 10 or more, 11 and 2 in 06, then 11 and 2 in 7, 10 and 3 in 8, and then 11 and 2 in 09. So 43 wins, 8 and 4 against P5s, win over Oklahoma in there, uh, and uh, Oregon State, they beat uh, in the bowl game. Um, but not a lot, a lot of games, not a lot of P5s. Now let's go to 2020, 2021, and project what's coming up this year. 11 and 1 in 20 during the COVID season, yep. where uh, you got to give that team more credit for going 11 and 1 uh, just because of how they had to do it. And, and playing the, the a game two days before. Getting tested all the time. <laughs> yeah. Not knowing if you're going to have an opponent the day after. Uh, and then 10 and 3 last year, uh, number 19 in the AP poll, but 6 and 1 against the P5s. So 21 wins, 6 and 1 against P5s. Arizona was the only one with a losing record. And then they've got Notre Dame, Baylor, Oregon, Arkansas, and Stanford on this year's schedule as far as P5s. So. So where do you fall on this? Which stretch to you is most impressive? Well, I think the, the, the national championship stretch stands alone. The, the earlier stretch with, uh, you know, Wilson, McMahon, uh, that, that's, that's an incredible run. Uh, Nixon's group, you know, four years in, in double figures. Um, but I went to, okay, who'd they play? How many P5s? And that's why we listed the, the number of P5s. And, and I'm going to go, if, if BYU can go 3-2 and two against P5s this year, maybe even 4-1, and one, depending on how Notre Dame and Arkansas go, um, I would say this stretch. This stretch is of, of 20 with COVID, 21 and 22. You've got a national pandemic, and then you've got more P5s than any of the other teams played, even counting the four years of that run with Nixon's group. So I know what you're going to do, and I'm going to let you take the platform here, but I, I'm thinking where they are right now and where they can go this season, they have an opportunity to trump the other three. See, I love topics like this because it's so subjective. It's based off of what you put the most importance on. Is it the teams that you faced? Yeah. Is, it the, is it the level of opponent? Is it ultimately the number of wins that you had over the three-game stretch? I'm going with what you said was certainly a, a three-year stretch that stands alone, and that's the 83 through 85. In my mind, nothing can trump if during the three-year stretch you win a national championship. If during that three-year stretch the end goal is being the best team in college football, that's the three-year stretch. And you mentioned the the wins, 11 and 1, 13 and 0 obviously the championship year and then 11 and 3. Then you have the quarterbacks that you had who are just historically good with Steve Young in 83 and then Robbie Bosco and what he was able to do injured. Look, and the other part about it is we talk so much about 84 and I and I know that there's been a lot of people that said they think 83 was even the better team. Yeah. Look, and let's and 79 might have been the best team ever. So I I just I can't go away from the 83 to 85 stretch because you get 35 wins. You win a national championship. At the end of the day, like I could it's like a mic drop. You win the national championship. Done. That's an awesome stretch. You can't argue with, with that stretch. I'm, I, I, I'm in the here and now, and the here and now is BYU is on the cusp of becoming a P5, joining the Big 12. They're playing they're, they're 21 and 4 over the last 25 games. Blaine um, Fowler wants to know why you're discounting his time here. I, I, I'll deal with Blaine <laughs> later. Uh, but but, I, but the, the quality of the opponent and, uh, and, and, and the quality of the athlete. Yeah. I mean, BYU's a P5 school now, heading into the Big 12. Um, 
they are the kind of team that BYU dreamed of playing against during all those runs. How can we get a P5? Well, we can get to this team. That they're, you know, the Michigan game and the Holiday Bowl was awesome, but Michigan was 6-5 and five coming in. It wasn't uh, Ohio State um, that BYU played in the Citrus Bowl uh, and, and should have beaten. But um, I, I just love where they're at now and with the schedule, which they did not have back then. If McMahon and Young and Wilson and Bosco had this year's schedule, I would love to see how that would play out. And I would, I would like our chances. Because I like BYU's chances with a healthy Jaron Hall. But those guys just didn't have that opportunity. They're playing in the WAC in the Mountain West, uh, the dark ages of the mountain, where, where uh, most of BYU's games were hidden from the rest of the country. Uh, th that was erased because all of BYU's games are on ESPN in, in Independence. Yeah. Uh, or at least most of them. Um, and so great debate. I, I just I think they've got an opportunity to seize it this year with five more P5s coming. Well, and I think the fact that the current stretch we're in, and again, we'll have to see how it plays out this upcoming season because if they don't get the 10 wins, then the three-year stretch... It, oh, it, yeah. it, they got they, work to do. They've got work to do. But let's, for the sake of argument, let's say that they can do it. I, I, I think then the fact that we're talking about that type of stretch and comparing it to seasons like the other seasons we've talked about really puts it into perspective how high a level the football that we've seen played has been over the last couple of years. That this is, I don't want to say it's a renaissance because BYU has consistently been good in, you know, winning eight games, eight, nine games. Uh, and certainly in a Bronco, I mean, they were winning eight, nine games just about every year. But I, I, I hope people realize what we're witnessing right now in terms of BYU football history, just how good the program is at this point, that we're comparing it to some of these other ones, I think speaks for itself. And remember, the war drums leading into last season uh, was uh, this is the toughest schedule in BYU football history. And you're losing the number two overall pick in the NFL draft. Right. And then after last season ended, the drums began, and it's like, well, now this is the toughest. Yes in school history. Uh, those same arguments can't be made uh, back in the day during those amazing runs by those other teams. So different place, different kind of athlete, different expectation, yeah. um, but a great debate because uh, a, a lot of programs can't have that debate. Yeah. We're Which talking of the best of the four or this yes. or the one thirty. We're talking about games? a lot of wins, and that's fun for BYU fans. Regardless of the generation that you've watched, you've had a stretch where you've saw BYU – win a lot of football games, and that's what's fun about this program. Yeah, I'm putting it on Puka and Jaron and <laughs> Brooks and all those guys to uh, make my case. When we have this conversation again in December, we'll yeah. go, yeah, this is it, or now let's go back to the 83, 84, 85 awesome group. All right, our question of the day, staying with this topic. Assuming BYU wins 10 games in 2022, which streak – of 10 win seasons is the most impressive in BYU football history. Let's hear from you, BYU Sports Nation, here in Voice of the Nation. This is the Voice of the Nation on BYU Sports Nation. All right, before we get to some of the responses, we do have a poll up on Twitter and on Instagram. So we'll start with the results of the Twitter poll. Right now, uh, 83 through 85 is leading uh, pretty significantly. They have more than half of the vote at 52.4. Hey, look, until the ballots come in from Florida. <laughs> All precincts are not, are not yet in. 35% uh, <laughs> agree with you, Dave. It's 2021. That, those are the two most popular answers. You know, 609 is kind of getting dogged here. Yeah. You deserve better than that. Yeah, 11.6. matter of fact, 79 and 81, <laughs> you deserve better than that too. Yeah, 1.2% <laughs> on the Twitter poll. Now, now it's it's always interesting to me the differences between the Twitter and the Instagram poll. A lot of smarter people are oh, on Instagram. Boy. Okay, Instagram poll, the 53%, <laughs> so almost the exact same percentage that had 83 through 85 on the Twitter poll are going for 20 through 22. I think the scheduling matters to them. But it, again, it's 1-2 either way. Uh, 83 through 85 at 31%. 2006 through 2009 is at 12%. 
and then 3% for 79 through 81. That's awesome. Uh, our first response on Twitter, uh, let's see, says, uh, any streak that includes a national championship has to be the most impressive. Maybe uh, that could have been my tweet, too. Uh, also on Twitter, uh, Brandon Borgett, uh, probably 83 through 85, as there's a natty in there, but 20 through 22 probably has the toughest opponents to what you said, Dave. I'll change my answer to 2022 if BYU makes and wins a New Year's Six game this year. Man, look, put right, restrictions Brandon. on it already. Throwing it down. It's so greedy. Join the conversation 24 7 on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook using the hashtag BYUSN. The best of BYU Sports Nation rolls on after this. Get caught up in the week in Cougar Sports. This is the best of BYU Sports Nation. Welcome back to BYU Sports Nation live from Studio B. He is Dave McCann. My name is Jason Shepard. And joining us now, happy to have BYU Assistant Athletic Director for Football Academics, Jason Ayu, joining us here in Studio B. Jace, I saw you at the uh, Cubs football camp there a couple go. of days yep. ago. It's good to have you in studio. I appreciate it. Thank you for giving me all the heat. The camps was, uh, <laughs> Got it. It's hot out camps there. been a little crazy. As we had unbelievable turnout. And so, yeah. Our beat writer from the Falcons was on earlier, told us it was what, 99%? She, she said 90, yeah, 99 like degrees, and then with the humidity, it felt like it was like 104. Oh, yeah, so we got, we got yeah. that cold. We got a dry yeah. heat over here. We got here the dry heat like over that. here. <laughs> Jason's happy because there's two Jasons on the show now. It is. So I don't, you, do, you feel, do you feel left out a little bit? Well, I'm in the middle, so I don't feel left out <laughs> per se. But, uh, but I, do, I am interested in your opinion on our poll question. Mm -hmm. uh, so you've got three groups of teams that have won 10 games or more for three straight seasons and, and won 06 to 09, won four. And BYU is on the cusp of that this year if they can get to 10 wins. So which is the most impressive of those four? Oh, this, this one right now. Yeah, this season right now. Yeah, but that, that, obviously I'm part of that team, so I'm going <laughs> to say that and with our staff. But uh, I also like the strength of schedule. I think we've played a very competitive, competitive uh, schedule the last few years, and so I'm definitely going with. I think that's those. a great, uh, a great answer. What do you think, Chef? Well, again, I went with when you win a <laughs> national championship, it's sort of a mic drop. But you know, it, Jason, we were having this made this point earlier. The fact that we can talk about multiple eras of BYU football, it's where it's this, that speaks to the health of Absolutely. the program overall. Absolutely. That's incredible. That's an incredible accomplishment. And so it's great because I was part of recruiting, and that's a big part of our tradition. And it's a real live tradition that's currently ongoing. So it's, it's an, an awesome spokespiece to say, be able to share. Well, and we'll, we'll get, into, get into some recruiting a little bit because you mentioned, you, you know, obviously that was, that was your position, but you have a new position now. We mentioned it, uh, assistant AD for football academics. What, what's been the biggest change for you with the new role? Kind of explain what you're doing now. Well, it, you know, my very first, my first four years here at BYU, I was the academic liaison mm -hmm. for football, and so I was very familiar with Trevor and all the, and all the people, the happenings over there. Uh, Kalani asked me to take over recruiting for a couple years, which I did, and now I'm back into the academic side, which is, which is awesome. It's a great step forward for the program with, uh, with the Big 12 and expanding resources and allowing more full-time employees and more learning specialists, more mentors, and we have an incredible group up there. And I'm really excited to be able to be part of the ecosystem for the student-athlete and taking care of our guys and taking care of all the student athletes here at BYU in particular. It's interesting because the, the, the time period we seem to be in is the uh, recruit comes to campus and wants to know what you can do for them mm -hmm. with an NIL deal and guaranteed playing time. And if I don't like it, I just might leave. Mm -hmm. But your whole side is we want to get you educated and send you out with a degree as well. So you got to find a balance in this, this new kind of wave of thinking, don't mm -hmm. you? Yeah, we're, our whole thing is very holistic. Our mindset is not on the money and the quick things right now, but we're trying to create better fathers, better men, better brothers, better husbands, and those things. And those things are all important to us. What they do on the field, what they do off the field, and their future is very important to the well-being of our student-athletes um, with the whole Built for Life and the things that we do, love and learn, our culture. And so it's much, much more than just an NIL deal, which I can get you right now. And if if players are chasing that, um, maybe not a good fit 
for us here at BYU. If that's just what they're chasing. If that's just what they're chasing. And what parents love to hear in that sit down with Kalani is everything you're talking about. Saying, Absolutely. How can I make 100%. my son better? Yeah. Uh, as opposed, how can I, be, you know, how can I pay him right now? You can, you can actually get a little bit of everything now in college football, but your emphasis is we want him here for four years and we want him to, we want him to leave with a degree. Well, I am in a unique position where I have a son on the team. And so I'm looking at things from my, as a father perspective and what I would want for my son and the care and support that I would want him to have. And it's the long-term things. It's the careers after football. It's the spiritual support, the educational support, the athletic support, the medical support. All that plays into the role what I would want personally as a father. Um, yeah, but I don't, I don't know if I'd want my dad having access to my GPA. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Trust me. Jazz is I'm doing fine, like Dad. Just take that. <laughs> take that. Well, and look, like the, the big topic that everybody's excited about, and it's one of the biggest, if not the biggest thing to ever happen to BYU, is the invite to the Big 12. Mm -hmm. And you obviously, for, look, fans and us in the media, we can just enjoy the excitement of it. You guys have been behind the scenes since this happened, and there's so much work that has to go into getting – not athletics ready for this. Give everybody an idea of what things have been like behind the scenes as you guys have really been working hard to get this athletic program ready to go in another season. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think it started with Tom and and Liz and Brian and that whole senior leadership of, of, of preparing ourselves and what does that look like, going, going to uh, even the academic side, you know, even the, from the medical training side, what, do, what does that look like in other places and how can we be a competitive? And now we have unbelievable resources. We have a, a huge football staff that I'm very blessed to be a part of just for academics. That's never been done before. And just that alone is exciting to see the step forward and, uh, you know, being part of the Big 12 made that happen you know, and opened up resources that we've never been able to have before. The last time uh, I interviewed you, I was writing down quotes for a, for a newspaper article mm -hmm. about recruiting. Um, and, and as you mentioned, you'd been uh, spearheading recruiting for the last few seasons. So where were you, what were you doing when you got the call that BYU had been invited to the Big 12? Because you knew how big of a game changer that would be for recruiting moving forward. But do you remember where you were and, and, and did Kalani call you or how'd you find out? I was, I, I don't know exactly where I was, but we've been down this road before. 2015. 2015. Right? And so I was very reserved. Like, I'm a, now I'm like, I need, I, I lack faith. I need to see it. <laughs> and, Come on, Thomas. You know, like, I need to see it. Like, we were so close before. Um, but I just remember the excitement. And I felt very, uh, we felt like we'd done something together collectively as a football program, as all the sports were unbelievable, winning championships and so forth, competing. And then, of course, with the direction of Tom Homo and President Vorking and President Worthen, it was just a. An so it wasn't a call, wasn't a text, wasn't a tweet. It was just you just came to work. It was. And well, I mean, we've today. been talking about it for a while as yeah. a staff and trying to keep the players down, you know. And like I said, we've been down this road before, and it was just kind of like you got the Utah game coming up. Done. There's yeah. a lot of things yeah. to focus on. Things are focused on, and if it happens, Klein did a really good job. Like, hey, there's a lot of things going on in the media. A lot of assignment. Let's just focus on the task at hand and whatever's supposed to happen will happen. That's the way our mindset was. Well, there's nobody more qualified to talk about the recruiting aspect of this whole thing than you because that's what you had, you've been doing. Mm -hmm. So give us the pre-Big 12 announcement versus the post-Big 12 announcement in terms of how recruiting has changed. Oh, recruiting, uh, winning obviously trumps a lot of things. And we've been winning the last couple of years very consistently. Now that you have the Big 12 being invited to the Power Five, it checked the last box that most recruits were looking at, even top LDS recruits were looking at for us. Do they, they don't play in the big dance, they don't play in the big conference, and now that box is checked. And we probably have more four-star, five-star, top three-star kids ever coming to visit our campuses all through spring ball than we've ever had before. And so we're indoors now. Probably solid. I think most top LDS recruits would bring us in, but didn't really sit us down and have a real seat at the table. We have seats at the table now. Well, it took a sword away from your opponents, including one that's not very far from here. Mm -hmm. They can't say, well, they can't go to the biggest games. They can't say they don't go to the biggest games, and they can't say we don't put people in the NFL. And we've done both of those things in the yeah. last couple of years, and we're going to continue to do so. And the, and the program under Coach Sataki is – 
we're, we're trending so high right now. It's awesome. Let's talk about Chaz, your son. Speaking of four stars, uh, one of the biggest signings of, uh, that had come to BYU out of Tempview High School, right? Mm -hmm. and, um, and injuries have been in his face for so much, but, but is it all behind him now? Is he, is yes. he ready to – he's going to hit camp on August 3rd full bore. He'll be full bore, ready awesome. to go. He's had some injuries. He's bulked up. He's at 220 right now just so he can play. You know, last year when, when Keenan got hurt, uh, they moved Chaz down from safety to play more back or row in the box, and he was only 208. And so this year we're prepared either way to go up, play down, play in the box, play outside the box. And he's about 220 right now, feeling really, really good. So What does that put him at? Does that put him at linebacker, or does it put him – there's a it's hybrid safety. Yeah, it's hybrid safety. again. Yeah. Depending on the personnel, if, yeah. it's a, if it's a four three, he'll play the strong safety. If it's a three four, he'll come down into the box. So, what is the expectations? Obviously, oh look, the expectations are always going to be high. What's the feeling in in the program, in the locker room with these guys heading into this season, which obviously will be the last as, mm -hmm. as an independent? I, we feel super excited about the team, about the program, about the players that we have. The, the, we have a lot of veteran leadership that's played a lot of games together. Um, and so as long as they stay healthy, we'll be – we're – Ecstatic. I don't want to. I, I mean, I'm in academics now, so I can brag as much as I want and talk. But <laughs> you can say whatever you want. I think we're going to win a lot of games and we're going to surprise a lot of people at what we're doing. I think the success, 10 wins, is, is, will not be a surprise to me. Well, congrats with your new post. Yeah, congratulations. Sounds exciting. Parents, uh, parents everywhere of kids sending them to BYU are happy to hear that, that you've got that in place and, and, uh, and we're glad Chaz is doing well. Thank you. Thanks for having me on the show. The best of BYU Sports Nation will be back after this on BYU Radio. This is the best of BYU Sports Nation on BYU Radio. Here's Whip Around presented by Marisk, your integrated container logistics company enabling global trade for a growing world. I, saw, us off. I saw Devo in concert in Vegas. Mm -hmm. so when they played Whip It, you know, it's like... These guys still got it. My uh, my oldest son wears a Devo T-shirt, and I'm like, you, you know, that's vintage. Very retro. That's old school. It's very retro. Twenty four seven Sports released a list of the top ten biggest trap games in college football this season, and they include BYU and Notre Dame on that list as a trap for the Irish. So what's BYU's biggest trap game this season? You know what? I was actually looking over the uh, the schedule and tr and trying to come up with what I thought was was the biggest trap game. And it's not like this team is somebody you would ever take lightly because it's an in-state team, but because it's the game before Notre Dame, I yeah. went Utah State. Because look, look, it's at home. Right. Obviously, we, we've had a lot of success over Utah State. This certainly it's should conference be- conference weekend, yeah, ESPN. It certainly should be a, a, another victory for BYU, but I, I went Utah State because it's right before Notre Dame. That's where I landed. I agree with you because it's also right before Arkansas. You got Notre Dame and then yep. Arkansas back-to-back -back weeks. And you have Utah State on a Thursday night on ESPN. That's the one I'd circle as, hey, be ready for those guys. All right, Fox Sports put out a graphic showing which teams have had a player win the Davey O'Brien Award, the Doak Walker Award, and the Bolitnikoff Award. Only three teams have won all three. BYU has won two of those. They're only missing the Bolitnikoff Award. Is Puka BYU's best chance to win the Bolitnikoff since Austin Collie, who we thought came the closest to it? How about throw Heisman in there, too, and get BYU in another there we circle? Go. There we go. Uh, Austin Collie was spectacular in 2008. Uh, he wasn't even named a finalist, which is a, which a is sham. Kind of crazy. Over 1,500 yards, 15 touchdowns. Uh, Michael Crabtree won it from Texas Tech. He only had four more touchdowns than, than Collie, and, and Texas Tech was throwing it everywhere. Um, Puka's got an opportunity, so does Gunner. They have an opportunity against a national schedule on national TV to make the kind of waves necessary to win these kind of awards. I do not want to make sweeping, high expectation comments, but I think Puka Nakua has a chance to be one of the best, if not the best receiver to ever come through this program. I agree. I, I think he's that good, so I will not put it past him. I absolutely think that he is BYU's best chance to get that right now. There's no doubt in my mind. Well said. As mentioned in the headlines, Clark Barrington was named a Phil Steele preseason first team All-American. Uh, where was Blake Freeland on this list? Yeah, where was Blake Freeland? This is a guy that a lot of people think could be picked in the first 15 to 20 picks of the upcoming NFL draft. Yeah, 
Yeah, BYU's line is look, loaded. and that's that's not saying that's not taking away anything from Clark Barrington. Clark absolutely belongs on here. We were just surprised that there weren't multiple players. Certainly, Freeland being the other guy. It's going to be fun to watch them run against South Florida. Yeah. All right, this one's fun. Uh, by the way, are you a Stranger Things fan? Do you have you watched it? Do you even know what we're talking about? I know what we're talking about, okay. but that doesn't mean I watch. Okay. Well, first of all, you need to watch it. It's really good. All right. Uh, the Indiana Fever of the WNBA have custom Stranger Things uniforms because Stranger Things is based uh, out of the great state of Indiana, Hawkins, Indiana, which I believe is a made-up town. I don't believe it actually exists. So this got us thinking, what movie or TV show would you like to see BYU-themed uniforms? I think it's for? a no-brainer. I'd like them to see uh, after further review. <laughs> oh, shameless. A picture of Blaine on one side <laughs> and a picture of Nixon on the other. And where are you? Smiling. Uh, I wouldn't be on the helmet. Uh, You'd be on. You could be on the. Maybe you could do a. That's where we could bring the bib back, and you could be in the middle I of the bib. I could be the bib, or or you could just say Tuesdays at seven Eastern. Uh, by the way, uh, July twenty sixth. That's just around the corner, less than six weeks away. Uh, we have a one hour special on Tyler Algiers' run to history as our season premiere for After Further Review. The guy loves to So anyway, that's what I'd do. Okay. What, what would you do? Um, here's what I, my, my, my justification is like what's, from a social media standpoint, what's garnered a lot of attention over B, for BYU over the last couple of years? It's been dancing. Kalani on the sideline has been remarkable. It's fantastic. Yeah. And then Cosmo with the Cougarettes. That right. got obviously so much traction. So I'm going to say, how about, so you think you can dance themed uniforms for BYU? You see okay. where I'm going with this? I, I see the theme. I, I don't know how it I don't know how it translates to a jersey, but I, I love where you're going with it. That wraps up the best of BYU Sports Nation this week. Tune in next Saturday for the Cougar news you need to hear. And catch the BYU Sports Nation simulcast every day at noon Eastern, 9 Pacific, on BYU TV and BYU Radio.